is Indian country today. Esquili, omiyasa'e. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungva, and this is Indian Country Today's weekday newscast. We have a lot of information to report this morning on the spike in cases across Indian Country. Let's bring in our uh, Washington editor, Jordan Bennett Begay, to tell us more about what is happening in the, the latest numbers. Jordan, thank you for joining us. Hi, Patty. Yeah, eh. thanks for having me. So last night we had a story talking about um, the rise among the Pueblo groups that uh, has really been startling. Can you give us an update? Yeah, sure. Um, so our reporter, Leah Chavez, um, reported that the New Mexico Department of Health uh, had two clusters of cases, one in San Felipe Pueblo and the other in Zia Pueblo. Um, Zia Pueblo had 31 confirmed positive cases and not too far from there, San Felipe had 52 cases. And this is really um, interesting and it's just kind of startling because these are these two Pueblos have small populations of people. Um, in Zia Pueblo, they have a population of 900 and in San Felipe, they have 2,200 people. And so when you look at that and break that down and to find the infection rate, um, the percentage for Zia Pueblo works out to 3.4%, and the, uh, San Felipe, it works out to 2.36%. Um, and if you compare that to New York City, you know, they have 74,601 cases, with, and they have a population of uh, 32 million, or 32, uh, 3.2 million, sorry. And that, that infection rate breaks down to 2.33%. And so those numbers are just really startling in these two small communities. And, um, and over uh, in Indian country altogether uh, nationwide, there's a total of 656 cases and a total of 28 deaths uh, within the Indian health system that we found. Um, uh, those are the latest numbers. It's really uh, startling to hear those numbers. And uh, from what we understand, at least in uh, some of the cases at San Felipe, the people had come, come together for a funeral and, um, and that virus spread in that, uh, at that ceremony. So we are looking at these cases and, and, and that's kind of what we're, uh, authorities are looking at that contact tracing, seeing if who, who was uh, in, affected and tested positive and then looking around at everybody else they were in contact with to trace back. Yep, exactly. And that's what I taught when I interviewed uh, the Navajo Nation Council Delegate, um, Nathan Brown, a couple weeks ago. Um, he's in charge of the Chilchimbato and Kienta and Adenahoso chapters. And that's like the hot spot of where all these cases came out of and, and on the Navajo Nation. And he was telling me that on one Saturday or um, that, there, that these communities had multiple gatherings. And so people are shaking hands, giving hugs, and you know, that just caused a spike. It, it, it is suspected by health officials and authorities that this is where the um, you know, spike came out of in the cases. Right. So it's um, again, it's the the message is not seems to still not be getting out there and um, we'll continue to follow that. What other stories are we working on uh, now, Jordan? Yes. Um, so uh, other this morning, um, Dalton Walker had a story about um, two uh, indigenous women who were studying abroad um, in Europe and they got back home. So that was um, an uplifting story this morning. This afternoon, we're going to have a story about uh, Native truckers uh, from Aaliyah Travis and how they're being impacted. And again, I'm working on the story about the lack of surveillance in Indian country. And there's um, also Colby Kicking Woman is working on a story about how uh, ath spring athletes are getting an extra year of eligibility because their spring season was cut short. Um, so, and there's plenty of other stories coming. Um, you know, underway right now. Okay. Well, thank you for the update, and um, we'll continue to follow all, all stories related to COVID, as well as other stories that, that are making news um, across Indian country. Jordan Bennett Begay, our Washington editor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Our guest today is someone who is very familiar to people across Indian country, and that is Dr. Evan Adams and he is the Chief Medical Officer with the British Columbia First Nations Health Authority. And we want to welcome you to our program, Dr. Adams. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Patty, it's so nice to see you. Yes, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really difficult time for our people and um, to be able to hear from a, a First Nations person who's been a medical doctor since 2002, 
Um, and I think maybe not a lot of people realize that when you were shooting the movie Smoke Signals, you were actually in medical school at that time. I, I actually started medical school when uh, Smoke Signals came out. But, you know, I'd been an actor for a long time, so I really um, didn't lose my focus at school. And, try, and uh, yeah, so all the hubbub around the movie, I tried not to let it distract me. <laughs> That's quite a feat, but um, uh, so you know now you've been in practice for a couple of decades, and um, uh, what do you make of this coronavirus pandemic? Well, it, it's definitely a surprise, isn't it? And uh, um, pandemic and infectious diseases and looking after populations is exactly my work. I'm a physician in uh, public health, and I work. Uh, in Canada. I work in the province of British Columbia looking after about 170,000 uh, First Nations people. And uh, yeah, this really came uh, out of nowhere. I remember March the 6th, I was at an event with lots of First Nations people shaking hands. And by March the 8th, um, like I haven't shaken someone's hands, it's March the 8th. March the 8th, we started to do that foot, foot shake. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so things have been developing, haven't they? They sure have. I, and I, I think about that same time frame. That's also when I just said, nope, can't do it. Mostly because we had been monitoring the situation in both Italy and also, of course, in China and South Korea. And so that idea of not just social distancing, but really not having that interaction was so important. And uh, at the top of our newscast, we learned about the rise in the cases among the Pueblo people. And it's, it seems like people are still coming together for those uh, whether they're traditional ceremonies or other ceremonies, and having that contact. What's your best advice to our people? Um, I, I am hearing from a lot of people um, who are having trouble adjusting. It, it, is, it is a switch in mindset, absolutely. I remember the first 50 people or so whose hands I refused and how upset they were, and I'm still seeing people um, on social media saying, uh, we, we need to have our funerals. That was an important person who passed away. We have to do something. Um, but uh, here in Canada, we, we had a funeral um, in um, the Maritimes in the Eastern region where 150 people were infected at a funeral. So we have to modify a lot of our practices, um, our cultural practices, and it's difficult for people. But this is a new virus. It's a novel virus. Um, we, we're adjusting. We don't quite know how to, how to, how to do this, but it's, it's clear. Um, I'm, I'm using the very simple, of an, simple analogy of we can have Christmas in January. We can have Christmas in July. Uh, we can honor someone or have our ceremonies uh, later, like not too far away, but we can't do it now because we're trying to protect our knowledge keepers. Very good. I think, um, uh, that adjustment is hard to make, and it's hard for me not to see my mom. To not, you know, I'm, if I if I I can't go up and hug her, I can't shake her hand or anything. So if I do see her, it's from a distance, and um, and that's that's hard. So it's definitely it's definitely um, hard on our hearts when uh, when we can't hold uh, our loved ones. And uh, I yeah, just recently. Um, my nephews and nieces who are like under five um, came to see my parents who are in their 80s and I, I couldn't let them hug each other. Um, one of the kids had the sniffles and uh, I just said, we just, I know it's, I know my parents didn't understand. I know the little kids didn't understand, but we just had to keep them apart. Just, just wasn't worth the risk. And we said, you know, you can hug them later. It's hard on people. Well, do you think that's making us appreciate each other more? Hopefully, I think I think uh, many of us miss uh, what we used to have for sure. I see that all the time, and I think for for some of us, um, this is very traumatic. We're facing a lot of rules where we can't do certain things, and it reminds people of a of another time. And we have to listen to the government, and some people don't trust uh, the government or doctors or the system, and they're really bucking it. Um, some communities have even closed down and they have like literally military checkpoints where you have to speak to a policeman or a military person or a, a tribal member and you have to explain who you are and why you're there and why you should be allowed in or allowed out. Um, and some people are being refused and it's, um, it's tough for people. Stressful. Yeah. 
Yes, and so we'll talk about stress in a little bit here, but let's uh, let's look at the the uh, um, symptoms of of, of COVID nineteen. Uh, what symptoms do we look for? Uh, because we know that you know, and what does the word asymptomatic mean? You know, we're hearing all these. Sure. Things. Yeah. So we're so asymptomatic means that you have no um, symptoms. You have no subjective experience of being sick. But some people have this experience of being sick where they you know they're called symptoms and for some people they're mild and for some people they're moderate and others they're really really quite severe but they're really um uh signs of a of a upper respiratory infection like from up here and then a lower respiratory infection like down here a cough um some shortness of breath uh sore throat some people are even describing uh like a fever mild fever or a severe fever some are describing like the, the stuck headache and it's quite a severe tiredness. It's a, it's a bit of an unusual presentation, not like um, other coronaviruses or, you know, simple, simple colds. What about um, uh, the loss of smell? Ah, yes, yeah, some people are describing that. Um, and it's called what we, or we call it pathognomonic, as in it's a very unique symptom that um, points towards um, corona. Virus nineteen, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So then, so say somebody starts to develop these symptoms, and uh, we're in flu season. Is there a way to to kind of self check at home and say this is just flu? Uh, some people who have survived the coronavirus say, no, this felt different. What is that difference? How do you analyze yourself? Sure. Um, I, I just want to remind people that um, many of us will get this. Um, maybe even the majority of us will get this over the coming months. And that for the vast majority of us, 95% of us, uh, it will be um, asymptomatic or a very mild presentation. And so, um, you know, you're going to be fine. Don't, don't be too afraid. I, I think a lot of people feel like, um, like something really bad is going to happen happen to them. So most of us can deal with those symptoms. Um, we can stay home. There's no need to, no need to be tested. Unfortunately, um, there are very few tests. So if, you are, if you're having mild symptoms, there's really no way to confirm that you actually have um, COVID-19. Um, those tests are safe for people who are um, really sick or who already have um, some underlying illness where they're they're really at risk and it would be very helpful to know if they actually do have COVID. And uh, sometimes it's being safe for um, you know, essential personnel like um, healthcare workers, um, you know, whom, whom, whom we're really in need of right now so they get a priority test. Yeah, so basically a lot of us um, will have symptoms and no ability to, de to test. We're just guessing that we have it and we have to stay home and look after ourselves. All right, and then at what point do you should you go to the hospital? Well, you should definitely um, go to hospital uh, if you cannot manage your symptoms at home. Like if you're having uh, such a shortness of breath that you can't accomplish your activities of daily living, like you can't cope with um, your circumstance, um, you should definitely go if your fever is uh, above 102 and is consistent. Like you can't manage it because you can try and bring your temperature down, right, with a wet cloth or with Tylenol. Um, uh, or if your family can't cope, that's reason to go to uh, emerge. Like let's say you're looking after your elderly parents or a small child and you are frightened by what's happening in front of you, you can bring them. That's a, that's a reason to go to emerge. Okay. And, um, and then... Uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, concern about uh, wearing a face mask. Um, so really wonderful little, I mean, I even made some, I can't sew. So I found a really simple um, a tutorial on how to cut up your running socks. And you're a runner too, so you probably have plenty yes. of face masks in your drawer, right? And you just cut the ends off and cut the top part off and boom, you've got a, a nice little face mask that you can wear. Um, so you. You, uh, what, what is your take on that? Yes, well, here in Canada, um, we are absolutely recommending the use of homemade uh, face masks. Um, 
medical grade masks are for medical personnel within a clinical situation, but most of us will be looking after each other or being sick uh, at home and wearing a mask is really better than nothing. It's better than not wearing anything uh, at all. So I'm waiting for my um, homemade mask to be made by one of my sisters. Uh, they're making them uh, at home with their sewing machines, but they're giving them to those who are most at risk. Uh, you know, I'm young and strong, well, relatively young. <laughs> Not as young as I used to be, but you know, I'm still young and strong. And so, um, you know, the little ones and uh, our elderly um, family members and the ones with chronic diseases uh, like diabetes or cancer, they get the masks uh, first and um, they wear them whenever they're out. Uh, in public or when they're looking after each other. Yeah, so, well, I'll have to share with you uh, my uh, special technique that I learned <laughs> on how to make it. Yeah, it's, and, go ahead. Send it to me, I'll be so happy to see it because uh, I'm curious about all the different ways that people can cope at home and, and make masks for themselves. Yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about traditional healing. Um, I've seen on Twitter a lot of people posting about, you know, man, I'm burning my sage, I'm, I'm boiling up some cedar, you know, drinking some cedar tea. Is that, uh, we know that there are definitely healing properties and our traditional ways talk about that. And so if you have that, um, what is your best advice? Um, well, I certainly, um, I certainly believe in things like uh, we need to have our bodies and minds and spirits be as strong as possible as we prepare to deal with all of this. So it means going back to basics, um, eating well and uh, getting enough sleep, keeping our mind clear and um, strong. So whatever does protect that for you, maybe it's ceremony, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's um, um, singing or even things like meditation or for some people it's um, like a, preparation like uh, you know eating certain foods um i certainly i certainly know that things like um sunshine and fresh air are helpful so i'm encouraging people to you know open their windows and throw open the doors and uh, uh those are all good things i'm even saying to people um you know this is a disease of breathing so um you might want to look after your lungs like you could reduce your um smoking or vaping um, right now, and that might help you in the long run. Uh, where I do get concerned um, is that there are some people who are saying, "Oh, you can you can cure this, or you can prevent this by going to a sweat, or by I don't know, eating a lemon." I don't think any of us really know that that is the absolute truth. So, I I I am um, I would I would say I would remind people this is novel. And we don't quite know how to. Um, I know how to deal with it. So when people are saying to me, oh, you just eat a lemon and you'll be fine. I say, mm, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then going into a sweat lodge presents, again, that social distancing issue. So those kinds of ceremonies. Um, yes. And I, I did hear an elder say to me um, on Facebook that she was going to have a sweat because it made her feel better. And I said, that's wonderful. But that part where you invite strangers to come and be with you, because uh, she had done that. She said, you know, I feel better. So I'm going to invite others to be with me in the sweat. And maybe they'll feel better too. I said, yeah, that social contact. Because yes, it's hot inside the um, sweat lodge. And heat is bad for COVID, as in, you know, it can destroy it. There's still things like droplets and still things like touching each other and there's still things like, you know, contaminating um, water, um, you know, around uh, the sweat lodge. And there are just so many other factors that you, you just don't know about it that are not controllable. And also um, that knowledge keeper is valuable. Like we don't want to lose that person. Um, she can sweat uh, later or she can sweat uh, by herself or with the people in her household that you know, she's already exposed to. So she took my advice as far as I could, I could tell. And I'm just telling people, just be careful. Um, oh, some people have what we call magical thinking. They just go, oh, well, I've just decided this lemon or this ceremony is just going to be exactly perfect. And then they don't think about it anymore. And, and that's just a little, um, uh, a little too convenient. We have to keep thinking and keep thinking. 
Have you been finding that, that when you're like even just going to the store, you have to keep your wits about you? You're constantly thinking, oh, don't bump into that person. Don't. Let me tell you, I've yeah. been in the grocery store since early part of March, and I went this past weekend, and I was so stressed. I had my scarf yeah. wrapped around my face and everything. Half the people had protective, you know, masks on. Uh, the other people didn't. The Half of the store uh, employees had some kind of mask on. The others didn't. And I'm trying to step aside and let people pass. And then I had a, a really, really awful, and the more I think about it, I almost don't want to, but the more I think about it, um, I had three young girls pass by me, and none of them were wearing a mask. And they, I stepped into the aisle so they could pass, and they were looking at me, and when they passed, one young lady started laughing. Or, or started coughing, and the other two started laughing. And it just, I, I wanted to get away, um, probably reported them to the manager, because people are being um, uh, signed, fined and cited for that kind of behavior, because it's it just, it's like a little act of terrorism. So yes, I find myself stressed uh, when I go out and I don't want to go back out. Um, and so let's talk about how do you manage your stress? And you mentioned earlier about going out to run. Uh, mm -hmm. You are a marathon and half marathon runner. Yes, that's right. And uh, and my work is very stressful. This um this health work, trying to help um, people be okay and dealing with you know difficult um, health situations, human health situations. Uh, so yeah, I I feel like uh, I've been feeling kind of tight. Uh, and it's interesting because um, I know for most of us, most of us have not gotten this infection, but most of us have been stressed by this, you know, loss of work, worrying about the future, worrying about getting infected, worrying about bringing that infection home to our loved ones. It, it's a bit, it's a bit stressful. And I, just this morning when I was listening to my colleagues talking and seeing how tight they were, I, just, I felt, I really felt for them. I, I wanted to encourage them to um, really kind of quiet down, quiet their minds and settle and, 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 and to kind of relax into that this is going to be around for a while, that this is a marathon and not a sprint. And uh, as you know, you're a runner too. When you're running, you just have to kind of settle in and say, okay, I have to do this hour after hour after this, step after step, like tens of thousands of steps, like just give in and relax. It doesn't mean um, stop thinking, it just means got to kind of be in it and breathe. And so I, I, when I'm out and about, I'm always thinking that. Like, just stay calm. Just deal with everything that comes up. Oh, someone's coughing. Oh, someone touched that thing and I've just touched it. What do I do now? I can figure it out. Yeah. So if we're in a marathon, what mile are we at? <laughs> we're, uh, we're in the first mile. <laughs> we are in the first mile, which is um, kind of adjusting to the, adjusting to the pace the first mile, you're thinking, oh my gosh, where, what have I done? Why am I here? <laughs> this is craziness. Uh, and hopefully in the next, uh, the next mile, we're going to settle in up a little bit more and go, okay, all right, all right. This is wow. Okay. That's, a, that's a, quite the analogy to think about, you know, what we're doing here. And, but, but it's also good to con consider a pace, like you said. So a, a pace to your daily life. And, um, and find what works for you, what doesn't, and let those things that stress you out. So, you know, I, I'm a journalist, but I try to uh, reduce the amount of news I consume in a single day from other sources other than IndianCountryToday.com, right? <laughs> but um, I am I'm trying to find ways, like, I'll binge watch. You know, this weekend I plan to binge watch something. I don't know what. But, uh, but fun, you know, uplifting uh, movies. So. Yes, you know, I, um, I work a little bit with the Canadian Space Agency and I speak to Canadian astronauts and the Canadian government has literally said, wouldn't it be great if Canada's next astronaut was an indigenous person? And uh, those astronauts have said that, um, you know, they're in a can, tin can floating through space, hurtling through space. And they said the things they think about are their loved ones, and that they wish they had something interesting to do. And it really made me think of um, our people and that our love for each other is really central. 
and that we should do things that are fun and interesting. It's called the pursuit of pleasure. It's not a bad thing, it's very human. So we must find things like you're describing that make us happy, um, that give us pleasure, even if it's just chasing a ball outside by yourself, if it's going for a run and making your legs sore, if it's beating, if it's um, you know visiting um, with someone over the internet, if it's reading, we have to do those things and keep ourselves okay. I, I, I feel bad for people because I, I see already some people are showing signs of kind of losing it. It's like, no, come on, hang on. You're gonna be, you're gonna be okay, we'll get through this. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to end our interview. Uh, Dr. Evan Adams, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. We know you're going to go see patients today, you know, from this and uh, uh, we uh, extend our, our good wishes and prayers to you that you stay safe and healthy and, um, and take care of our Indian people, you know, our First Nations people. So, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, again, um, Dr. Evan Adams, our guest on our program today, and um, that will conclude our newscast. On behalf of Indian Country Today, I'm Patty Tolohungba. Uh, <laughs> Again, take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. And we'll see you tomorrow. This is Indian Country Today.